disarmament as it is going on today is a patchwork of success and a patchwork of failure. It's not homogeneous, it's not yet over. There are some areas which where guns have really been taken. There are some areas where guns are still many. But the common characters today is you don't see a gun. But doesn't mean to say they are not yet there. Because then the fundamental question of human security, the sense of human security, freedom from fear, freedom from want, are not fully addressed. And more so, the sense of state security is from sedentary communities. We have continued with, of course, the forceful disarmament. Mm. And um, as a result, the neighboring districts of Kitgum, Padel, uh, Lira, Dokoro, Katakui, uh, Kapuchurua, all those that used to be disturbed by the Karamajongs are now peaceful. The Karamoja region is found in the northeastern part of Uganda, an area of semi-arid savanna, bush and mountains. That 27,200 square kilometers are home to the Bokora, Mazeniko, Pian, Gie, Dodo and smaller groups including but not limited to the Pokot, the Tepez, the Labor, Niporain and the Hik. The last census report of 2002 indicates the population to be just under 1 million. But a 2009 special report of the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs in Uganda places the figure at 1,051,167. Like other pastoral areas in western Uganda, Karamoja lost part of our fertile soils to the national game parks in the 1930s and 1940s. Internal borders were also drawn to transfer Drazian pastures to agro-pastoralist populations of Teso and Lango. In addition, each ethnic group was given a county, and county boundaries were made no man's land. While Karamoja was formerly one single district, it is currently divided into seven districts, namely Abim, Amdat, Kabong, Kotido, Moroto, Nakapiripirit, and a park. The official policy in the name of providing security and effective administration and production is transforming pastoralists into agro pastoralists by increasingly limiting their movement and thereby sedentarizing them. Other effects of this policy have been numerous and include ecological decline as herders graze their cattle on diminishing pastures. Development of gun-based cattle raiding since the 1980s, gun accumulation as a response to state terror, and increasing involvement in the cash economy, notably through the sale of cattle. I would like you to look at the nexus poverty, conflict, and marginalization. And if those were Venn diagrams that you are drawing, you would imagine what would be taking place at the very point of intersection of those three Venn diagrams. Uh, as these interacting factors play out in a place called Karamoja, which is really part of Uganda, maybe it's an annex, it's not part of the main document of a country called Uganda. One of the manifestations of the different um, interventions that have been attempted in uh, this region um, tend to have the impact of sedentarizing the communities here. Um, that is to say from uh, policies of education to decentralization to just even your general development uh, policies. What started as a voluntary disarmament nearly 10 years ago turned out to be forceful and violent. 
The program used the cordon and such military tactic where the army would cordon off an area and search the Manyata houses for weapons or warriors. This program was widely contested by the Karimojong and led to tough resistance. <laughs> When the president launched this program in 2002, I think 10,000 guns were brought. But it was on quid pro quo. You bring a gun, you are paid. What happened? Now they would use this money to go and buy more guns. So we are busy capital financing the restaurants to give the money to invest in the guns. So we said, no, 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 we stopped. So when we stopped paying money, they stopped bringing the guns. Despite the appeals on radios, in meetings, they stopped bringing the guns. We said, oh, okay, now we start calling and search. Now, that's where we lost even a commanding officer in Kutudo. We need to provide security for the Karamojong. There is no way Karamojong is going to hand over his machine gun if the government will not defend him against the Pokot and the Turkana. Right now, the game being played by the Uganda government is called Blame the Victim. The Karamojongs are also victims. They are victims of neighbors who are armed pastoralists, armed with superior weapons. And the Uganda government has not been able to protect the Karamojong against those hostile neighbors. One of the biggest problems with the fashion in which it has been done, the so-called cordon and such arm operations, is that it does not uh, take into account um, the human rights of the people involved in particular the human rights of uh, the people who are being disarmed. And you can look at that from uh, all sorts of angles, including just um, violations committed in the course of the uh, disarmament exercises themselves, but also from the perspectives of um, obligations to protect in the absence of uh, uh, civilian uh, kind of um, instituted protection arrangements. I come to Karamoja at a time when security is becoming stable, when we can seriously talk about development in all these districts have been, that I need you to continue to work with UPDF and with the police to ensure that total security can prevail in Karamoja. Instead of being suspicious about UPDF or the courage you to work with them and establish a relationship that will really help security to become more stable, which is what everybody is working for. Although raids and gun ownership continue to date, frequent visits by the minister in charge of Karamoja and First Lady, Honorable Janet Museveni, are considered key in the improvement of security in a region that ones with nest ambushes on a daily basis. Previously close to the rest of Uganda, an increased presence of media and humanitarian organizations has opened up the region to the rest of the country. And indeed, the impacts of forcible disarmament have spilled over the borders of Karamoja and onto the streets of Kampala. If you came to Kampala in 2002, 2004, you wouldn't see any Karamojong on the street. 2006, many on every street corner. That was not a coincidence. It was it was very directly linked to the the introduction of the force of the disarmament. So the phenomenon that we are having now of talking about Karamajong street children 
really to me started in 2006. I'm sure it's a very familiar now uh, scene of a very like tiny baby about three years old who well, had her hand stuck out like that and she was dozing. The marginalization of Karamoja over time has had adverse effects on the Karimojong, especially women and children who have been forced to flee to other areas that seem to be safer havens. The capital city Kampala with its ever-growing population seems always to have space for them. But here, they are reduced to street life with begging as their main source of income. To 14-year-old Okui and his siblings who have found a way out of Karamoja, Kampala streets are what they call home. Their livelihood has shifted from being pastoralists to being destitute, begging for survival all day and all night. Though education is a priority to these children, the means to achieve that dream has been shattered for now, leaving them desperate. My name is Lokui John. I came from Moloto district. I am here, I am begging. And when we are was there in the village, our father, she was paying him for school fees. Then, one day she was going to look for the cow. The rebel, she killed him from there. And all of us, we are just stopped to go to school. One day we was there, Kampala Road. Somebody like you, she came there. She was just told us, you want to go to school? And for, for us, we, we are just saying, yes, you want to go. And he wrote, he was writing our names. Just get this taxi, but it's not taxi, Toyota. All of us, we just enter, and she was taking us to camping, sir. These children are safer away from this area and into camping, sir, if they go in the right way. And so the government decided all men, women, children, what everybody had to go to camping. So the children were confused. This policy of picking street children and dumping them by Kampala City Council is in conflict with the law. Especially given that the facility was originally designed as a correction center. There, some, some days or some months, there is not food and water and clothes. People sleeping down. Food, many things in camping, sir. They are beating people badly. For Karamoja, removing children from their cultural and traditional setting and replacing it with the formal system only makes it worse when the system does not provide for the children to continue beyond the primary level of education. This then not only approves them from their livelihood, but also leaves them with no employable skills. As Lokui's story demonstrates, a vicious cycle has been firmly established. My grandfather, he sells a small goat. In the morning, we go to the bus gateway and we came to Kampala. We start to go in the town to beg. We come, I was a young, nine years. We come here in the street, we are, we are, we are start to beg. And we came back, we buy Chikomando. <laughs> and we start to eat. We came there to bed and we go to sleep. In the morning, we go back. Oh, Saturday, or oh, Sunday, we came to wash our clothes. You know this, this car which was jam, eh? We are going there, we are just told the boss, give us some 100. Someone is saying, go oh, stupid, Garcia. Someone is give. Big problem in the town, she's beating us. And we don't have, any, we don't have anybody who can to take us to school. The children are the greatest victims of uh, a backward society. When the Muchiga migrates from Kavale and come to Kampala, he's going to pick a hole, and within a year also is a different person. When the Karamojong migrates from a hostile environment here and go to Kampala, 
he or she is going to sit on the veranda and continue begging and begging and begging. Knowing that the only way of survival is what? Is begging. As I said earlier, the disarmament has, by many different accounts, has been a very brutal process. And, and not necessarily a fair process. And one of the impacts of that has been that many men have taken off into the hills to avoid being arbitrarily arrested, arbitrarily detained, beaten, all of the things which we know have happened in the course of disarmament. So you have large numbers of men who've gone into the hills, they've left their, their wives and their children back in the Manyata, and there's just nothing to eat, and there's no money coming in, and so those wives and their children are amongst the people who have been forced to come to Kampala amongst other places to, to try and survive. So there's a very di direct connection between the disarmament and the, the kids on the street and the, their mothers who are also with them on the street. No, for the army actually we have even gone beyond the mandate. For example, tackling education is beyond our mandate. We began by forcing the children to leave the cattle and go to school. Because the Karamajong would send the children with the cattle instead of sitting them, letting them go to school. Now when you come down to education, the challenge now is uh, the, there's now effort to adjust the education system and adapt it. So there's alternative basic education for Karamoja, where the hard boys now learn for only two hours a day. When they bring the cows home or the kraal, learning starts. Before they take the cows out in the morning, learning starts for two hours, for four years. That, that way we've been able to get many of them to join the formal school. Out of 43,000 that enrolled in alternative basic education to Karamoja, when we evaluated recently, we found 15,000 made a successful transition to the formal school. Because UP is not delivering. The normal delivery system of government of Uganda are not delivering. You need extraordinary action. And we're now trying again to take ABEC to the crowds, to the mobile herders, to have mobile schools. When we did a survey recently of 22 big crowds in Karamoja, we found about 14,000 kids, school-going children, in the crowds there. It's like when you move to the crowds, you cease to be a citizen of Uganda. You lose your right to education, your right to health, your right to everything. You are just there to whom it may concern. Because to us in Karamoja, we believe that we died a long time ago. <laughs> we are not supposed to be here. There is a tendency, not least by government officials, to regard the Karamojong as backward and in need of bringing up to speed with the rest of Uganda. I think we must all agree that Karamoja is in this state because the people are poor. I mean, because the people are not only poor, but because they are lazy. Yeah? The people of Karamoja are lazy and they are highly infectious with what? Beggar or dependency syndrome. Mm -hmm. And to my gentleman here, this issue has been asking that the quota, uh, the, 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 the quota sending to Makerere for Karamoja should be made bigger. I will not agree with you completely. Because schools in Karamoja today, when they are to go into their classroom, they have the best laboratory, they have the best books, but what are the people doing? They just sit and do nothing. Our role here is to try to change the minds of Karamoja people and first of all make, make them understand that they are poor because they are what? They are lazy. They were from Egypt to, to Canaan and they were living in a camp. He told them that if they, that he visits his people in the night, but that if he gets to a camp where people have no latrines, that he will turn away from them and whether they are praying or not, he will not listen because he does not go to filthy environment and therefore I've been saying to the Karamajong that men who have refused to build toilets are responsible for keeping God away from Karamoja because God will not go to a filthy environment. I think you know everybody should be asking themselves not what is the problem with the Karamajon, but why do we have a problem with the Karamajon? The assumption is always it's their problem, but actually there should be a, a careful examination of why why people are so reluctant to entertain or 
to, to accommodate some diversity within 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 Uganda. Although pastoral sedentarization is encouraged by international development agencies and national government as solutions to food insecurity, poor health care, education and problems of governance. It has not been demonstrated that abandoning the pastoral way of life and particularly children's access to milk and other livestock products is beneficial to the health and well-being of pastoral populations. For such groups, cattle are both a status symbol and a primary source of food with a corresponding dedication of time and effort to tending to them. One important animal product consumed is blood, which they drain from the cow, and milk, which they obtain after a long day's herding. The mixture of the two is a staple in the Karmajong diet. Elders who oversee the performances commandeered rituals, while the youth, commonly known as Karachuna, are actively involved in slaughtering and other duties. Some of the values are, are progressive, mm. but others also are backward, <laughs> and then they need to be changed. But at the same time, there is a desire to discourage pastoralism. There is, a, 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 I mean, nomadism. There is a desire to discourage nomadism. It's moving around with the cattle, so you do not want to give them facilities that will enable them to move so free and far and wide. It spreads diseases. It encourages thefts, it encourages insecurity. So if you are going to provide security at home, somebody would ha should have no reason to move elsewhere. Somebody has a thousand heads of cattle, he's looking for pastors. Is that progressive farming? Now the problem is that the nature of livelihoods here, or at least the, the patterns with which our people subsist, requires um, a lot of association with the animals, with the cows, which um, in order to feed properly, you will have to move. Um, so our, or at least one of the contradictions we are seeing is um, a desire for uh, quote-unquote developmental policies, but policies which at this point in time are contradictory uh, to people's livelihood patterns. Contradictory in the sense that it tends to limit people's mobility. Again, you see that in the 30s, in the 40s, could, uh, you know, 27% of the Karamoja land was taken away and made wildlife sanctuaries, okay? And then 9% was made national forests. That's 36%. In 65, the parliament of Uganda passed a law to make the 64, the remaining 64% of Karamoja land control hunting area. So entirely the total land of Karamoja was put under conservation status. <laughs> So, if you were a Mugana from Mukono, supposing Mukono, supposing the whole Mugana was made like that, what would the Baganas be like today? The Karamajong have been treated for a long time as a completely different group of people, as somehow apart from the rest of Uganda, and you know, that, that's something which has a history going back to the British colonies. And, you know, and, and that difference of treatment is, is visible in, in some of the policies which are being used. In its later stages, the disarmament program involved protection of cattle by having all animals under the protected crowds manned by the UPDF. Even today, when we've been having carrying on cordon and such, the indication that somebody might be having a gun, what not try that is that when we see with cows in your home, and when people coming to them, there is a high suspicion that you have a gun. And 90% of that, you got the guns from them. The consequence of the way this armament has been um, carried out is uh, you know, things like this. Uh, what you would consider um, camps for internally displaced cattle, if you wish. Um, this is clearly an indicator that uh, this armament is a failing um, exercise and that uh, the military, which is ordinarily supposed to be protecting um, national boundaries is ultimately having to protect our cattle. In both ways, uh, in terms of failure to protect the national boundaries as well as involvement in protection of cattle, I think um, all are indicators of a bad situation, indicators of uh, failure, massive failure in terms of uh, its um, obligation towards the nation. This burning protected cows in Karamoja, sorry, 
declare in grammar meaning the Karabajos. Because why? What was the reason to have this protected crowd in it? It was basically because we got the guns from this poor. They said, now, okay, we are gi I'm giving you a gun, but my cows must be safe. We thought that keeping these cows in the people's homes was very difficult. Then we have the protected crowds. But in the Middle East, when we still have raids in Karamoja, and this bad protected crowds was and for all, it's like announcement that, please, Karamajos, go for the other money. Really, because someone needs his cows to be protected. And the guns are just near here. The solution to insecurity is security. As we speak, we have abandoned the scheme of collective crowds. You know, previously we do receive cattle in the evening mm -hmm. to guard on behalf of the warriors mm -hmm. uh, for security reasons. Article 209, paragraph A of the 1995 Constitution of the Republic of Uganda, mandates the Uganda People's Defense Force to preserve and defend the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Uganda. Ironically, Civil society organizations and human rights activists have accused the Uganda People's Defense Forces of abusing this mandate. There's a lot of human rights abuses, particularly torture, of, uh, as soldiers go to cotton and such on forced disarmament and take away the weapons. The first complaint came with the Human Rights Watch. And uh, we investigated. We found, actually there was a parliamentary committee in 2003 mm -hmm. to investigate those allegations. Many of the allegations made were not true. The second incident was about the 66 children. Mm -hmm. We had about 66 children crushed by EPDF vehicles. Mm -hmm. I didn't know where that heartless. Mm -hmm. But suffice to say, we requested for either the graves or the bones of these 66 children. Because mm -hmm. I know my Karamajongs don't bury. Mm -hmm. said, okay, if there are no graves, where are these bones? No one could produce even a single one. Mm. But the only sense is that uh, there was some politicking mm. to undermine the disarmament program. The government is come, if you have the guns, you take. But if you have the guns and you be silent, Somebody should stay. This one deserves the guns. And he came to beat you and then say, remove the gun, remove the gun. If you refuse, she take you there in the barracks and start to beat you. I was able to get a group of people who were able to get a group of people who were able to get a group of people who were able to get a group of people who were able to get a group of people who were able to get a group of people who were able to get a group of people who were able to get a group of people who were able to get a group of in Karamoja, there is also a policy of enforced misery based on official neglect. It is important that we, we draw the, the differences. The way I see it, very soon Karamoja will also have now the big IDP camps, like in Acholina. And the government now has shifted the bulk of the UPDF into Karamoja. With all the attendant problems, rape, human rights abuses, unchecked violence, unnecessary roadblocks, uh, attacks on civilian property. In a way, Karamoja is becoming another theater of conflict similar to what a Choli land has been. Do you want to go back to Karamoja? I know. Why? Because, because there I don't have my, my, my parents. But now Karamoja is closed because there's nothing. Somebody is not expecting anything out of here. Why does he come here? Less than 10% of Ugandans have ever visited Karamoja from other regions, even not even from Teso here. Because they are not interested here. What is here? We should create 
pull factors in Karamoja. We create other people, they come, they interact with Karama Jones, we create a middle class in Karamoja, we create a, 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 a employment in Karamoja, out of that. At the end of the day, we shall see this place devolved. So whereas government can boast having taken away 25,000 guns from Karamoja, if each gun is like 500,000 for argument's sake, you can see how much money has been taken away from that community in terms of resources and what is being injected into that economy to transform the gun economy into actually so that these people become from warriors in destruction to warriors in development to transform their heroism from destructive activities to heroes in development the strategy of the government is wrong in karamoja declaring war against the karamojong armed pastoralists is not the solution. We need to make the Karamajong warriors not to have an excuse for having machine guns. So the government of Uganda also needs to change its policy in Karamoja. The endless bombardment of Karamoja will not pacify Karamoja. It is instead bringing resentment. I know the only thing, uh, the thing that I can tell you is that Karamoja will be changed, but the key is with the children. If we work hard and at least educate these children who are very bright, by the way, the Karamojong children, put them in school. They are extremely bright, especially in mathematics. Unless we change the attitude of Ugandans, the way they think about Karamoja, and even the Karamajong themselves, the way they think about themselves, we shall not go anywhere. But perhaps what is even more important is for Karamajong people to be involved in policies targeting them. Civil society organizations and other stakeholders are all working towards the betterment of Karamoja region. Their intervention includes development, peace building, conflict resolution and reconciliation both within the Karimojong and the surrounding communities. In the eyes of many, it's the Karimojong who need to change. For this to happen effectively, it involves changing the lens with which the Karimojong are viewed.